Our first lesson for this morning comes from Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 through 30. So listen for what the Holy Spirit is telling God's people. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Our second scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 1 through 13. So listen once more for the word of God. Hear. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your earnings for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Now you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that, you, that do not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For you shall go out in joy and be led back in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall burst into song, and all of the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. And it shall be to the Lord for a memorial, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Holy wisdom, holy word. Thanks be to God. Well, over the past uh, several weeks, past several weeks, we have been kind of wandering our way through a season of peace. It's this dedicated time in which we have considered our, what brings us peace, maybe personally or as a body, where we have uh, 
figured out what, it, what in our lives needs to grow in a sense of peace or, or how our world is lacking and in need of peace or, or how we as a, as a people might better and more fully live out our call to be bearers of peace in the world. Yes, we've journeyed through this season of peace considering all of these things and it seems to me that we've done so during a time in which there seems to be very little peace around us or even within us. I mean, there are, there are wars that are raging and escalating around the world. There are political tensions here in our own country. And, and of course, we are most freshly living in the aftermath of yet another devastating natural disaster, just 10, 11 days old. And we've seen images, we've seen them on our televisions and the internet. We've seen the images of what's happening in Israel, Palestine, southern Lebanon. The destruction that this war is bringing upon mostly innocent people. We've seen the political attack ads all over the place, right? Political attack ads that are that are demonizing people time and time again, especially as this uh, election cycle ramps up. And we see the ways that they, these ads have an effect on common people on the ground who seem to no longer be able to relate to one another in any kind of civil way. And then, of course, we've seen all the videos and we've, we've looked at all the pictures and we've heard the just awful, awful stories of the devastation of Hurricane Helene, that the devastation that it's dropped on most of the southeast of the United States and especially in our own backyard here. And you know, I can look at that and, and I can be grateful. My heart is, is grateful and I'm sure that yours is too, that we have largely escaped the brunt of what Helene threw our way. But my heart remains heavy and conflicted as well, and I'm sure yours does too. Our hearts are conflicted with, on the one hand, the relief that we experience because of our own safety, but on the other hand, the, the burden of, of knowing that there are others that are so much, more, so much worse off than we are, and our desire to kind of help alleviate some of the problem, especially our siblings in Western North Carolina as they begin that long and arduous journey of rebuilding their towns and their infrastructure, their homes, even their lives. And you know, I think back, I think back, all of this reminds me of my own experience, the experience of the Griffins from our days in North Florida. And I tell you these stories of the several hurricanes that we endured during our time in little Monticello, not so that you will have any pity on me, I need none of that. And it is not to disparage any of the stuff that is going on in our world, especially in our mountain communities, but to remind us that we are merely inconvenienced here at times. On September 1st, 2016, we had been there about two years, and that's when Hurricane Hermine made landfall. It was the first first major hurricane uh, to strike the Big Bend since 2005, so it had been a little bit over a decade, and it was only a Category 1 storm. Only a Category 1 storm can do a significant amount of damage, though. It damaged 2,600 buildings in the Tallahassee area and left more than a quarter million people without power for, for many, many days. And that included us, the Griffins, down there. And I'll say we were safe. We were safe, we were merely inconvenienced. Not going without power and internet is a mere inconvenience during situations like that. And our friends and our church family was safe and secure. All that was good. And we learned a thing or two. We learned a thing or two about how to, how to adjust our lives to the temporary new reality that we were experiencing, this temporary inconvenience. But what we also learned was the power of communities our community that pulled together, neighbor helping neighbor, banding together to support one another, clearing debris from yards, sharing resources with one another, and supporting one another in that time of need. 
And then just a year later, one year later, September 10th, 2017, that's when Hurricane Irma struck Florida on the Gulf Coast, a Category 4 storm, significantly more powerful. It caused over $50 billion worth of damage. The estimates for the initial estimates for Helene far exceed this. And you know, the little town of Monticello, we were there. It, it didn't hit us directly, this massive Category 4 storm. But of course, we were rural and we lost power from the wind and the rain that we experienced. Several days of losing power, several days of inconvenience. But what was worse is that just two weeks later, Hurricane Maria came through as well. Maria is that storm that devastated the little island of Puerto Rico. And you know, while we were grateful that we did lose power yet again, just two weeks after it had been turned back on, a mere inconvenience, and our hearts were heavy and cried out for the Puerto Rican people whose infrastructure was decimated and even today is still being rebuilt. Tropical storm Alberto made landfall near us on May 29, 2018, just six months later or so. Dropped almost or, or a little more than a foot of rain in a tiny period of time. So flooding was a, a significant issue. And, and you know, to be honest, if I think back, I, I don't remember Alberto all that much. I don't remember all of the, all the inconveniences we experienced because the reality is when I think about 2018, I can't think about anything other than Hurricane Michael. Hurricane Michael was a, a massive, massive storm. The first Category 5 to have hit Florida since 1992, and it was the strongest hurricane ever in recorded history to strike Florida's panhandle. And it made landfall. Mexico Beach, near Tyndale Air Force Base. It was less than 150 miles from where we were in the little town of Monticello. Maximum sustained winds of 160 miles per hour. That is an incredible amount of wind. Gusts as high as 172 miles per hour. They almost had to invent new categories for hurricanes because of Hurricane Michael. We had friends. Uh, the Christie's. They lived in Panama City Beach at the time, and they were in the evacuation zone. So they were forced to, to get out of their, of their place where they were living, and they came to stay with us during the storm. And you know, the power went out, of course, once more for us. But it was nothing, nothing compared to the devastation that happened on Mexico Beach. We lost power for several days, several days. Um, but every single house, every single house, save one on Mexico Beach, just gone. No more. There's a famous picture, you can probably Google it and find it, of Mexico Beach right after Michael. One house on the beach standing, surrounded by cement slabs where all the other houses used to be. Everything's gone. Absolutely devastating. Total cat catastrophe in every sense of the word. And you know, our friends, like, right after the storm, they were, they were itching to get back to see if they even had a place to call home anymore. And so they, they got in their truck and they hopped onto I-10 and they started to head west and they didn't get too far because the roadways were blocked off. They weren't letting anybody through there because they needed to get those first responders uh, uh, to, to where they needed to go. The roads had to be clear for those who were doing that initial work of establishing emergency response centers and, and getting uh, temporary shelters erected and setting up their communication stations. And so the Christie's, sad, turned around and came back and stayed with us a few more days. Only later did I have to go out west, several months later, to do Presbytery-related things and just to see the absolute devastation of acres, hundreds and hundreds of acres of national pine forests just utterly sheared off from the force of those 160-mile-per-hour winds. 
And all of that I bring with me to the devastation that Hurricane Helene has inflicted upon the mountains of southern Appalachia. Small mountain towns of western North Carolina that were there 11 days ago and now are no more. They are just gone. The people who are suffering, the people who are still lost without power or water or resources. And you know, it will be months, it will be months before we know the extent of the devastation that Helene has inflicted upon our region. And it will be decades, it will take decades to rebuild those communities that have been impacted by this storm. There is a lot of work to do and it will be a long time to get it done. Because the reality is it takes a long time. It takes a long time to rebuild. It takes a long time to rebuild roads and businesses and houses and homes. It takes a long time to build a, a feeling of community among people. It takes a long time to rebuild a sense of peace among people. A long, long time. And that, that is what is at stake in our text for today. In these words from the, the prophet Isaiah, who calls his community to rebuild their world in peace. I mean, these, these are words that the prophet Isaiah writes after, after decades. His community has been in exile for decades already. And these are the words that he shares with them. These are the words that the prophet writes to his community that is getting ready to come back and, and resettle the land that their grandparents and, and great-grandparents had lived in oh so long ago. These are the words that the prophet offers to a people who are needing to rebuild their nation, rebuild their communities, rebuild their lives rebuilding their roads and their businesses and their homes, rebuilding that feeling of community, rebuilding their sense of peace and wellness in the world. And this is what Isaiah says peace looks like. He lays it out for the people. What does peace look like? It looks like clean water for anyone and everyone to drink. That's what peace looks like. What does peace look like? It looks like food and wine and milk for people to eat at no expense. What does peace look like? It looks like a covenant commitment between all people, binding them together as a family of faith, binding them together as a human family. You see, Isaiah, he paints a picture for people. He envisions a rebuilt place in which the measure of success of the nation is not the reestablish of the monarchy, the Davidic kingship. It's not the reconstruction of the temple that's important to him. The measurement of success is not the gross domestic product of the state or the nation. Those are not significant to Isaiah. Instead, the measure of the success of the kingdom is the well-being of all its people. The measure of, of success of the kingdom is the access that anyone and everyone has, not only to the necessities of life, but to more than that, to the very goodness of life. The measure of the success of the kingdom is the utter unity of the people who are fully committed to extending God's grace to one another. The measure of the success of this rebuilt kingdom in Isaiah's eyes is the perfect peace, the perfect shalom that binds people together with their land, with one another, and with God. And it all works together in joyful song. It's a wonderful picture, a beautiful picture of peace. And that's what's at stake, if I'm truthful to you. That's what's at stake here at this table, each and every time we gather around it. It's what's at stake, especially today on this World Communion Sunday, as we share the bread of life together, as we share the cup of salvation together, and as we remember our common covenant commitment to be people of peace.
here in our own community and abroad, as we connect with people all around the globe with those same commitments. We remember the life and the ministry, the death and the resurrection of Jesus the Christ at this table. And we commit ourselves anew to living like Jesus lived, to giving up ourselves for the good of the gospel of peace. And you know, we remember that at this table, there's always enough for everyone. And everyone always finds enough at this table because God is a God of goodness and grace, because God is a God of abundance and peace. And there's plenty to go around. And you know, that's what's at stake for us as well in our own Appalachian community. As we begin the long journey of rebuilding, of building peace here in our communities. But with the vision of Isaiah and with this table as our guide, we can do it. We can bring about peace in ways that we don't even think are possible. With the vision of Isaiah and with the gift of and guide of this table, may we seek a peace that anyone and everyone can access. With Isaiah's vision and with this table as our guide, may we seek to build peace that is available to all. With Isaiah's vision and with this table as our guide, may we build a peace that testifies to who God is, God's abundant goodness and grace, so that anyone and everyone, anywhere and everywhere, all nations might be led toward God's peace. Let us go from this place to be the bearers of peace that God has made us to be. Let us build God's peace together. Amen. And friends, now we go out into the world that God so dearly loves. We go as people having worshiped together, having prayed and sung and confessed and listened for God's word, having made our commitments to serve God and God's people. And we have partaken of a holy meal that will empower us to be the bearers of peace and justice that we were meant to be. And so go, go and do just that. Go and build peace wherever you go, bringing God's grace to those around you. And as you do, I pray you go with this blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus the Christ, may the love of God our Creator, and may the partnership of the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, may that God go with you and with me and with us together this day and forevermore. Alleluia.